Welcome to this episode of Presentation Hell. Today, podcasting from Embark Studios in Tampa, Florida. I'm sitting here with Kevin Maney, the co-author of Play Bigger. It's a design category. Thank you, Kevin, for being here. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. I'm not the best at intros, but you know, it sounded good and we got it going, everything like that. So, so Kevin, you wrote this book about category design. And we, as, as people who are consumers, have used a lot of uh, products from companies who made category designs. Tell us and tell the audience what category design is and how it's touched them personally. Yeah, well, they so the the the, the really great companies, the companies that really changed the way that we we live and work, mm -hmm. tend to be ones who create something that is um, a missing thing in the world, right? Like a it, it, there, there's um, a problem that's gone unsolved because it wasn't able to be solved before. But people or, didn't know it existed. They knew possibly. there was a problem, but not well, that possibly, a solution. you know, but um, but there's sometimes it's sometimes it's a situation where there's a problem that's been age old and there's never been a you know really great solution okay. to it, right? I mean, um, sometimes the um, the shifts in context around our, our, this moment in time, the new technologies, uh, war in Europe, uh, uh, so you know, AI has affected changes. a lot. Yeah, it, like it these, feels like a these, whole new these giant changes in context create new problems to be solved or new mm -hmm. ways to solve old problems and and a, a new problem to be solved or a new way to solve an old problem is basically a description of a new category that needs to exist mm -hmm. in the world so we were saying like there should be a process for how do you how do you look at the world mm -hmm. um and and see where these possible new categories are and and then not only see them and identify them uh, but then shape them, like mm -hmm. put some words behind it so that people understand what that thing is. Um, and and then over time, develop that category so it's a benefit to your particular company. Um, because companies that win market categories tend to be the ones that not only shape the way we live and work, but they take away most of the economics. Of Give the us category. an example of something that all of the viewers might know about of, of a company that came out of nowhere to find their language, to find their identity, and and from the birth of it, everyone couldn't live without it. Well, so let me let me take a really old example, okay. just just because sometimes taking things out of context of like what we're experiencing. It's the gray right hair now. we've got that he's talking and, about, um, <laughs> not just me. So think about this. So there's a there's a great example in the the Chrysler minivan. Chrysler minivan. Yeah. Okay. So before. Before the, you know, there was, no, there was no vehicle like it, right? Before no, it was a big passenger right. van or right. a so, bus so or what a happens? truck. So here at Chry Chrysler, which was a company with its back against the wall at the time in the 1980s, it was, you know, having... For everyone, the minivans up. came out in the, 80s, in the 80s and then they became uh, the soccer mom's life and dream and they lived in it. It but they did, but, created but, something. But the point is, so first of all, I was talking about context changes, right? So Chry mm -hmm. Chrysler sitting there and they realized that there was a, an enormous change in context that was happening around that time that, that a generation was moving out to the suburbs, having multiple kids, um, taking the, you know, driving to soccer practices, more people were living farther away from relatives. So they need to make these long trips by car and all this. And, um, and it was creating a new missing. There wasn't the right kind of vehicle for a family of four or five to have the, you could, you to could be buy, comfortable. You could buy, to be comfortable. So you could buy like a, a an old school, everyone, old van. everyone had cars. There was all types, but or there was the design you know, of it. Station for, wagons. For you, 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 you could buy a station wagon. A station wagon was a long car with an area in the back where you could put your kids if you wanted them to get killed, if you got rear-ended, right? Yeah, I, and, I'm, yeah, I'm sure you did exactly. too when you were a kid looking the wrong and way out the back window. So they recognized this, this, this change in context and re realized that there needed to be a different solution. So they, they designed this thing that was supposed mm -hmm. to be a, a a van that could fit in your garage, drove like a car so that, you know, mom could take the kids to soccer, fit, you know, four or five people had bucket seats mm -hmm. in the back so the kids didn't touch each other and fight, you know, all these kinds of things, right? <laughs> One of the bigger issues. Um, and and so they, they uh, Chrysler went to market with this thing, not just by introducing these brand names of a Plymouth Voyager mm -hmm. or a Chrysler, you know, uh, whatever they called it, but but they actually introduced us to this idea that there was a new category of vehicle called the minivan, which was brilliant yeah. because yeah. it's not it's not the that's not the it wasn't that's a not car, the brand. it wasn't a real van, no, but, it wasn't but, a truck. But, but importantly, that's not the brand, right? That is the category. That's the thing. Well, now there's a dozen brands within right. that category now. Okay, and, and in fact, one of the things that if you create a category that really should exist in the world, one of the things you'll always see is others coming into it because it. They'll recognize business, that, that it's has an to, opportunity. It has to exist. 
Um, and but what's interesting about categories is they're literally they're they're a space in people's minds, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what it is. It's a uh, you're opening up a new space in people's minds. So before Chrysler came out with minivan, nobody thought about like there wasn't a family conversation no, of should no. we buy a minivan because that space in people's minds didn't exist yet. The company that manages to create that space in people's minds mm -hmm. always has an advantage in that particular space because people will always associate that company with the one that created that thing. And, and in fact, that company usually tends to be the one that gets to set the rules for that category. Because they're the expert from the beginning. They're the, they're, they're the, beginning. the original artist right. of the of the category. They yep. artfully assemble it, identify it, articulate it, let people know what that is so that the people go, yeah, yeah, you're right. I need a minivan. Right. And, and so then that becomes a conversation that no family had before. Mm -hmm. Now every family has, you know, you have the second kid and there's a conversation, oh, should we get a minivan or, you know, right? So be, it, they've created that space in people's minds. Um, and, and and by the way, that thing about setting rules, if you've noticed, you know, Toyota, Honda, you know, whatever, come out with minivans afterwards. First of all, they all pretty much look like collection minivans because yeah, that's the they standard. Do. They, they have the same set. basic look. And everybody will still call them a minivan, even if it's mm -hmm. from another that's maker, true. right? So they've created a cat. So we you see this happening over and over and over mm -hmm. again um in you know in business and 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 um so uh, the um our goal is you know in, in what we wrote the book about where the uh, you know how do you do that like how do you what's the playbook for first being able to see a category then being able to frame it um mm -hmm. and frame it in a way so People public, understand it. The, well, people understand it and people associate that category mm -hmm. with you so that you always have a would, driver's seat. Would we say like, you know, Disney for motion pictures is a similar type of thing and Ford for cars in a similar type of thing and Dell for a, uh, instantly assembled computers is a similar type of thing. You could you can think of tons of them. Yes. They go down the line. I mean, right, right. LinkedIn for your resume. Right. Is so LinkedIn, I no LinkedIn, longer have a printed resume anymore. But you go right. to my LinkedIn, you see this, it before I, this, this idea of a professional social network mm -hmm. was a category that did not exist before LinkedIn created it. Yeah. And 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 to this day, LinkedIn utterly dominates that particular space. There's no room for second place. Well, who wants to go where no one is? All right. Right. Yeah. Right, that's right. that's yeah. We see that up and down the line. You think like I don't know. I sometimes say who's number two to Amazon, and people say Walmart and. Well, they were number one before Amazon. So right, right. I'm just saying, you know, there's there's certain things. There's no one in there. Uber is so far ahead in their category and value. Lyft does the same exact thing, but they aren't perceived as the same yep. valued company. So Uber is a, Uber is another wonderful example. Um, so again, you think about before Uber existed, that space in people's minds of I'm going to pick up my phone and you know see a car going mm -hmm. around and and you know and, and order a ride mm -hmm. that idea that space in people's minds just did not exist yeah we all uh, you'd get off the plane and then you'd go get in the line in the taxi right. or you'd call and, a black car service yeah, or, or whatever like and, and ironically it's just a little side thing taxi is the one word in this whole planet that is the same four letters the same word it means the same thing in every single language know that. <laughs> every language on the whole planet taxi is the same you land in china taxi you get a car someone comes picks you up doesn't matter where you are just a little little note there, there i always felt was interesting but uh, uber uber but, but in so, a way changed it because right. the moment i picked up my phone and called the car walking off the plane was the last time i ever got in a taxi line yeah the yeah. moment i called the car while i was still in my house knowing that it's going to be there five minutes later and went downstairs and it's there and I didn't have to walk out on the street. My life changed that way. So Uber, um, well, I mean, it started out by identifying a missing uh, mm -hmm. in a new context. So, right, the, the Stuck classic, in the rain. Classic can't get story. The, the two guys are in Paris. They're trying to hail a taxi. They think this is stupid. And by the way, oh, we've got this phone with GPS on it. Like, actually, there, maybe there's a different way to solve this problem. Thank you, Stephen. It's Mr. Jobs. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, the, the ultimate category creator. <laughs> well, and he was. I mean, he was, right? I and, agree with that. Whether it's for Pixar, whether it's for phones, whether it was for music, whether it was for computers, whether it was for tablets, and every single app that, that bloomed from that indirectly has his seat in that, right, my right. opinion. Well, here, so here's... here. Um, Here's how Steve Jobs introduced the iPad in 2011. So he goes up on stage and he said, and he, and he fo follows this sort of category. Design yeah, he's picking. a great presenter. He loves right, his, his whole, whole but, setup. But here, here's a, so 95% of tech companies, if you ask, 
them to tell what you do, whatever, or why, why do you exist, whatever. First thing they're going to tell you is we make this. We have this product that mm -hmm. does this. They tell you what they make, what they do, what the product. See does. at Shuffler, we make presentations easier. But you, but even when you said that, right? You didn't tell me we have the software that does. That no, does I didn't whatever. do that because I, I, I know yeah. what was coming down. <laughs> right, right. I didn't want to look bad. So, <laughs> so ninety five percent of tech. If you go to ninety five percent of tech company websites, the first thing it says is we make this product that does this. That's mm -hmm. what it says, right? Steve Jobs gets on. This is how it should be done. Steve Jobs gets on stage and he first he describes. He says, um, "So the world of media is changing, um, and we're starting to consume all of this digital content." Um, books, TV shows, sporting events, music, it's, it's all becoming these, this digital content. So mm -hmm. we, first he's describing the world is changing, the context around what you're he's doing. He's describing is the world we live in today, 15 right, years well, ago. Right, right. But he, at the moment that this was all sort of in the mix, it mm -hmm. was what, what was beginning to happen. So he describes this, right? And then he says, um, and for, you know what? You don't have the right device for this. Because look, you could have you have the, the you have a, a you phone, have a computer, you have a phone in your pocket, but that's got a really small screen, and you know it's really bad for watching a football game or a movie. You also have this laptop; it's got a bigger screen, but it's really awkward and bulky, and you know you don't want to read a book on your laptop computer. So he he sets up this idea that there's a change in the context, and that there's that change in consciousness that created a thing that's missing in our lives mm -hmm. that we didn't even know. It leaves an empty space that you didn't know. We was didn't empty. even know it was there until Steve Jobs describes this, and then you kind of go, "Oh, well, yeah, actually, you're right. It does kind of, you know." Um, and so then, after all of that, he says, "So today we are introducing a new cat." And he uses this word actually, a new category of device. Ours is called the iPad. Is a sensor. Is a tablet computer. Um, and and he and he put up on the screen this tablet in between an image of an iPhone and a laptop, um, and said this is a new this is a new category that and 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 made us feel like oh I understand mm -hmm. from the moment he got off that stage why this thing is something that I would need, um, and and that's what great category designers do right they they and this they is the that. specialty of category design associates your company right. but what you do and and how you bring this forth and you coach companies I'm, I'm getting more yeah. to the utilitarian yeah, part yeah, yeah. and it all comes from this book play bigger which you can get on amazon you can get it in barnes and noble you can get them wherever the hell you want it play bigger <laughs> i founded my company based on a lot of the principles in this book but that was my little ad for you yeah. in, the, in, 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 in the process there um and we've talked about look you you, you know, for, i don't know what when did we five six years ago five, yeah, yeah at yeah, least something, something like that, that. and we we've talked about this over and over again i mean you followed this you followed this idea with Shuffler long as, before I met you. Yeah. I was deep into it yeah. for the for a and, long and, time. And then we started. You know, we did some work together. And and but you you know this idea that you've described, you describe like this. Well, where's your book? presentation? There you go. Yeah. You describe this. This is this yeah. is basic. This presentation is, hell. That's my career. This is the academic. Right. This is the strategy. <laughs> and but but so this is why this is why category design works because mm -hmm. so presentation hell. What that's actually that those words right there is describing a problem. That's right. It, you're starting with here is a problem that your paint that you painful. have, and I'm going to describe it for you so you understand that I understand what that problem that's is. That's right. And we're going to make it easier for you. Right. Here's and, the problem. Here's we're making it easier. Presentations and, and if, suck. They're a mess. Yep. Everyone's all over here. And, and if I believe that you understand the problem really well, well I'm going to I'm going to think you must know how to solve it. Yeah. Um, well, that's, and and that's the way that you've. You know that's the way you've pitched this company, right? Yes. All along, is that you were describe this problem, and it's not easy, and, you know, and it's not for the faint of heart uh, for my own. No. <laughs> just... But that's true because you know. So if you think about, uh, uh, if uh, you go back to a new category, is a new space in people's minds, it means that didn't exist before. That means there's a big burden on trying to create. <laughs> no, it is right. There's a big. There's... Here's the burden. It's called presentation. But that's, why, you, but that's why you do this. Yes. Because it's I'm a, a masochist. <laughs> no, but, the, but because there's, there's a burden to, to, um, to, cr to create this new space yes. that did not exist before. It's, I, and it's, and it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Yes. I view it as art. There, many of the greatest artists in the world, they look at a, a bunch of colors and a piece of canvas and they mix them together to make something very beautiful. In this in this environment, you see something out there, and it has to do with people and processes and efficiencies. And you want to create a system that makes a nice ecosystem where everyone is better in it, and you're needed in the process, and everyone's lives better. And that's kind of the way I look at my role in presenting this as an artistic enterprise, because yeah. I don't really know the next step. 
and everyone else after us learn the next step from us and they'll, they'll make it better. They'll tweak it. They'll, they'll make, they'll do all God bless them. That's what the, but, but to plow the field first is really the roughest thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, and there's a, um, and not to depress you or anything, but there's, but there's, you know, um, and we always talk to companies who say, you know, um, if you have identified a category that matters, that should exist, mm -hmm. that means that it should exist whether you do it or not. Correct. Oh, without a question. So that's that's the ultimate, like so when we work with a client company, that's the ultimate truth we're looking for. That's yeah. the truth we need to find. What is the thing that has to exist in the world, whether you do it or not? That is correct. And then you you only get the lion's share of it because it has to be proven by other people. Do, I have right? gone into places where I could not convince or make them understand anything until they saw one or two other people doing it. And then it was like, oh, I know exactly what you're doing. And they came right in because they had to keep up with the Joneses that way. I have found that media has actually helped and hurt me along the way. A, you, you always feel like you lost something when something else comes in. But we, I've spent a long time trying to convince and say, this is what it is. And it's efficient. It's great. And you do this. And, and I, I say it out academically, like I should have pads on my, my, my <laughs> jacket, you know, walking around. But in reality, when one of my new social media experts that are that are half my age, but much more efficient than I will ever be, within a 20 second post made for Instagram, everyone got it. Mm -hmm. They looked at it like, oh, that's the problem. That's the, the solution. That's the direction. That's the how to. There's the little euphoria. Now I'm out there. I won. Yeah. I'm like, God, it took me 25 <laughs> years and it took her two hours. Now it's getting everyone in eight seconds. So that's right. just very effective. I'm pointing right, right. it out that goes in there. That's incredible. So I'm going to take a minute before we pause here for a break. I want to ask just before we break, one, you've come down to Embar Collective yes. to give some of this knowledge to the companies that are here so that they can get some traction. Have you seen anything here that's special or is... Uh, why is your category design so relevant for a startup place like we are right here? Why should the people here know about it? it well, it's it, if nothing else, mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, a very early stage startup um, is probably not going to go through the whole process of doing all. Of it, but but having that mindset, mm -hmm. uh, just understanding what that mindset is like of uh, of a couple of things. Of one is if if you're going to go through all the trouble and you know how much trouble it is <laughs> yeah. to create a company, to yeah. build a company, why would you not want to try to build a company that is, um, that is creating and winning a new market category? Because that is what the way you could really matter. Right. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you're, otherwise you're a me to maybe trying to take some market share from some other, you know, some right. other category, right. That's not fun. That's not nearly no, as much fun. fun. If you're yeah. going to go to all the trouble to build a company, why don't you try to build a company that's really going to well, you, change the way we live and work. And that's what you you see going on here at Embark. Well, I, I, that's what they're striving for. I, I will yeah, say that I, mean, and I the, see the a lot company, of them. the companies are here because they want to be those kinds of companies. Oh, right. Um, and and so if uh, if we can do something to in it to to inject some of that way of thinking of of how to see new categories, um, how to once you see them, um, then frame them so that you can mm -hmm. uh, that you can be the one that that sort of guides and sets the rules for that category and ultimately wins it over time. And, and if we can just um, help some of these very early stage companies just have that mindset, we believe Getting that's going to help right them. You know, that's that gonna, that's gonna give them I, no, of... I'm going to say thank you because I, it makes a big difference. I feel I was doing it for years. And until I sat and read your book, did I feel like someone understood me? <laughs> <laughs> It's, but that's what we're talking about. I mean, like I, say, I was so uh, neurotically in my own mist that I think I, I really cast off a lot of people that really should have been supporters because I didn't fundamentally knew, know where my heart was driving me. And I picked that up through Play Bigger in many ways. And then, you know, we've known each other for a while here and it's right, actually right. better than that. This episode of Presentation Hell is brought to you by the book, Presentation Hell. This is my career. It is Presentation Hell. And if you want to get out of it, you can tell better stories. And the way you can do it in my career is based on a book called Play Bigger, written by Kevin, my, my guest here today. And uh, 
I was about to call you a co-host, but it's just a good friend. And this book is about creating a category and understanding how to make a business better to live for the long term. If you want your business to go down a direction and be known by the whole world, you need to play bigger. Now, you've had a long storied career. You've, you've been praised by Newsweek, ABC, NBC, The Atlantic. You've written books. You've been on the bestseller list. You've interviewed the top CEOs and some of the most incredible entrepreneurs in the world. How did you get there? Where did you come from? <laughs> what, what, what makes this person feed into such, you know, such a situation and have that? Tell me a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? What's, what's about you? Yeah, and where I grew up actually is a role because I, I so I grew up in a town called Binghamton, New York. Binghamton, New York. There's a SUNY college there. There's a SUNY college there. And Binghamton is also right next door to a town called Endicott, New York. Endicott. Endicott, New York is where IBM essentially was born. Okay. So you're like White Plains. Uh, no. No, no, you're up no, further. Uh, no, west, uh, sort of uh, western, southern New York. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Not that close to the city, up further. Three hours away from New okay. York. Okay. All right. Um, and uh, so growing up there, I mean, you know, IBM mm -hmm. was sort of in the dominant was, in was, everything, you know, everything yeah. in the community. Um, I went to uh, my first job out of college was I went to work for the local newspaper. Okay. There were a couple of different possible jobs I could have taken and, and, and they offered me the business reporter job. Mm -hmm. Never wrote about business in my life. Never had, but you were technology. young and fun and but just was, got out of school. But and it sounded, were going it sounded on like more fun than chasing cops around. Let's put it that way. At that point <laughs> okay. in my and did they pay you for at the time? Well, yeah. For, yeah. Okay. It was, well, it was a real job at a real so, newspaper. So it was newspapers actually actually had <laughs> real, real deal. All right. See, this is the real deal. Not in today's age. <laughs> no, no. You know, come and, right for me. <laughs> and so, if you're going to be a business reporter in Binghamton, you're going to cover IBM because okay. it's the biggest thing in town. Um, and. Uh, and really, from that moment on is when, like, I started writing about the, te the technology industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it just happened to be sort of coincide with the um, personal computers sort of coming mm -hmm. into people's homes. Before that, most people Am didn't Am I allowed care to about. say in the 80s? Yeah. Okay. Um, be because before that, um, you know, technology was computers were something that sat in a back room at a company and most people didn't want to read about it. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, a big, heavy, clunky right. pain in the so, ass. So um, I just happened to hit this moment mm -hmm. in time when, when tech became a, a real topic and, uh, and uh, just wrote that from bigger to the bigger newspapers. I got hired by USA Today in 1985. Um, and USA Today was, today was brand new in 1985. In 1985. The um, concept of a national publication like that represented did not exist at the right. time. So that was even groundbreaking. And it was, a, it was essentially a startup. And, um, and then over the next 10 years, it became the news, biggest newspaper in the country. Yeah. So and it was I one of the first that. ones to have color in the cover, right. absent the yeah. news, new tabloids. See, and, through, I know and, all this stuff. and through all of that, I was the, you know, I was the tech, main technology reporter and columnist and all that. I started writing books. Um, uh, first Make one, it seem so easy. First, well, it's not. <laughs> Yeah, the first one came out, and again, you know, sort of luck and, and skill sort of combined. That's the way careers are made, right? Is that, Well, it's um, also like computers. Writing is iterations. It, right, but, but no, as I say, that, that I got lucky again because I, um, uh, early early 90s, I started mm -hmm. writing about the, uh, you know, computer 500 channel cable television, mm -hmm. the, the information super highway, all those crazy things that were new mm -hmm. ideas of that. And um, do you know Bonnie Halper? Yeah, I know Bonnie Halper. Oh, of course right. I do. All right. No, no, I've known her for 25 years. That's why I was, when you were saying that, I was like, did you get placed in a job? No, 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 <laughs> no. But, um, and uh, so I ended up writing a book called Mega Media Shakeout that was about the idea. Hang on, hang on. Before you get there, yeah. I, I want to ask a little bit about something else before you get there. Who was the first big interview where you felt, oh my God, this just happened? And did it, or was it someone that was afterwards that came up? afterwards type of thing. Like I went to a conference with Mark Andresian and he was showing off something in the, in the 90s, some tech thing. And it was like really annoying. And we were in New York and stuff. But to know where he went from there, I always remember it now at this point, then it was just a booth near my booth. Well, that's the thing I was going to say is that what's, what's fun for me and kind of to what you're mm -hmm. just describing is that, um, that I met all of these people before they were you know, mm -hmm. so like I know Jeff Bezos or, or Mark Andreessen or uh, Mark Benioff and, um, you know, one after another, you can name that um, that I would have interactions with interviews when mm -hmm. they were just newcomers, you know, on the scene. When they were and, talking they, a lot they of became when they were talking a lot thing. of shit and people didn't really know what the dream was. <laughs> right. Right. So, you know, I, um, 
and I did. I get to you know I got to interact with with all of these mm-hmm. superstars and the, and the, some of the more established ones, that Bill Gates and Andy Grove and um, you know uh, uh, Lou Gerster winning the CEO of IBM and Sam Palm was out after that. You know, the, so like yeah, I mean I because of because of the job I had, I got to interact. You got with to all do it. You were people. you were the name under the job for the national USA Today, which allowed you to. It gave a license you go to into to yeah to yeah. San Francisco, New York, L.A., wherever it might have been. Really, it was San Francisco, and New York was for the money. San Francisco was for the product. Right, if right. I'm not mistaken, right, the right. way it kind of went down. And uh, but you, but just to go back to that, because because it was really mattered and how I got here was that um, I ended up writing this book about, which was a radical idea at the time of of how what was going to happen when all media became digital, mm-hmm. and just kind of how what that meant to the the industry. And it just happened to come out in April 1995. And it was that summer um, when the, the consumer internet just blew up and Netscape went public and, you know, that became a yeah. phenomenon and all of that. And suddenly, like, right after my book came out, there was this enormous hunger for, I got to learn what this, what this intense. internet, you know, the thing is, I don't have, you know, I, and I, I was you know, in my thirties, I, I had no idea what I was doing. I got invited to like give presentations <laughs> to boards of public companies and stuff. And I, I was, you know, I was like oh, really overwhelmed, but and it was really back then it was the first time they allowed children into the board. <laughs> yeah. It was the very first time that people in their twenties or young that walked in with t-shirts or sneakers or something actually walked into these white shoes, stodgy, oak filled boardrooms that had their own private elevators, right? Yeah, you know what I'm what talking about. Say, right. And they'd sit there and look and and oh yeah. So that was my you know, that was my first book and it just happened to hit at the right moment in time, which kind of gave me that uh, you know, a slingshot and being able to do more books. So I just started, you know, I just I like doing books. So I just kept doing more books. And um and Play Bigger, I think, was maybe the seventh book that I wrote or something like that, or six or seven. But they, they came together that way. In a way, play bigger captures a a strategy that isn't isn't just a a business story it's not just a, a new new widgets that that is everyone seems to have to buy right now and therefore there's a pile of money so it must be a story it, it it's captured something else that it brought it all this stuff kind of pinnacle that way is that correct well yeah and you know um i mean i'm sitting here talking about category design but essentially we did category design on category design. I mean, like that's what the book Play Bigger is. It created nice. a category of category design. Yes, I can see and, that. And, and and is in fact the like the the um you know the the, the thought leadership thing that it, mm-hmm. it establishes essentially what it is, the rules, everything I've been talking about. We did in that book what we now do for clients essentially. Well, to reinforce what you said and talk about Play Bigger that. People knew the taxi line sucked, but they didn't know there was a solution until there was one. And then they realized they didn't know there was a a market for the iPad until it was articulated and given to you that way. I was in the same place doing what I believe is category design, but had no way to understand that what my, my natural inclinations were actually other people had the same problem and it could be articulated in such a way that says, this is what I'm doing. Now you can believe in me more Yeah, and I can use it in a business plan and I can use it to identify things. And as evidence today, I've, I've known you six or seven years at this point um, and evidence today, you're here in Tampa amongst 150 startups to give your wisdom and knowledge that's in this book. And anyone who's starting up a company or building should buy and read this book. It is well worth it. And it's on every, you know, just search it. You'll find it. Thanks. <laughs> See, that was my plug for the thing. That's all. That's been all good. So here's a question for yeah, you. Yeah. Um, on, on, I live in New York for 30 years. I still live in New York and I still live in Tampa. Tampa, I call home. My business is here. I, it's a beautiful place to be. I, here's a plug for Tampa. Tampa is wonderful. If you have dreams, come here. If you don't, stay up north. No. Well, Sorry, just, well, dreams, I didn't mean it that well, way. Well, but your dreams get killed. <laughs> just saying, a wet blanket, <laughs> wet blanket of 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 oppression can lay upon you, and it can make you nuts, especially if you're a dreamer. So, okay, how's that? Yeah. That's, no, that's no, the way to do on. it. So, um, uh, on in in after I I was I was CEO of a funded company. I spun out a division of a a, a different funded company, IXL, that went public and stuff like that, and our Rain kind of ended at a certain point. I went through all the 
being loved as a CEO and then being hated and being the reason for everyone's demise and all that, all that jazz. And on uh, 9-11, I stood in my kitchen and my mother called and I picked up the phone. I said, hi. She goes, the World Trade Center is on fire. And I looked out the window and the World Trade Center was on fire. And I'll never forget that. My wife was pregnant. She walked home from Times Square, all that type of stuff. You have a very unique story about 9-11 as well, don't you? Um, do I? <laughs> do you? Weren't you playing? You wrote an essay back in the game? Oh, I did. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> fine. 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 <laughs> Okay. See, I was trying to bring, I did some homework. You know, here, trying yeah, to bring you did. I, like, I forgot about that. Well, see? No, actually, yeah, no. Um, uh, uh, so I was, I was living in Washington at the time. Okay. I, I, well, the USA Today Connection, which was based there, and I lived in the D.C. area for a long time. And um, I, I, from the time I was a little kid, I've always played soccer and, and loved playing. And I got involved with, um, so the Pentagon at the time had this, it doesn't anymore, actually, had this enormous lawn uh, along one side of the building. And um, the, um, the, there was a big group from the Pentagon that would, um, th three Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, go out on that lawn and play soccer. So you'd play soccer and, with the guys and, outside and, and, the and Pentagon. U, and USA Today was like two miles down the road from the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. And I got to know some of, you know, some of the guys that played. They invited me, so I started playing with these, all these Pentagon people. And so I was doing it like for 10 years before 9-11. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and then um, when 9/11 happened, the plane that hit the side of the Pentagon, the si that side was the side that was right along that lawn where we would play. Um, and uh, and one of the guys who was part of our crew got killed. Oh. Um, and and so there was a there was an email string with everybody's names on it. You know, so as soon as it happened, mm -hmm. emails are flying around. You know, of you know. Are you okay? Who's not? Who's not here? What's whatever, right? And um, uh, and then the then the conversation quickly turned to, um, like maybe it was like three days later. We need to play. We need to go out. This, there was that whole mentality of we need to <laughs> yeah, show we, the terrorists. We got to get re get back in right. the game. We are not going to have our life changed because of your actions. Right. So we went out. Uh, we all met. And went out on the field. It was a very touching moment, actually. We uh, they invited one of the um, pastors from the Pentagon mm -hmm. to come out, and we just all stood in a big circle and held hands. And um, everybody decided told their story of what happened that mm -hmm. day, if, or, and or who they lost or whatever. Um, the pastor sort of said a bit of a prayer, and then we kind of then we said, "All right, let's 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 play," and we played a game of soccer. Um, and um, I went back. I was so sort of moved by this whole thing. And I, I, I wrote back to the email string. Um, I, I just wrote what happened that day. Being a writer and all. I, I wanted the capture for everybody mm -hmm. who was yeah. there. Um, and I and said, that's appreciated, by the way, by a lot of people. And, and, and so it wasn't meant to be public or anything. But one of the people on the string sent it to somebody from NPR. Um, forwarded it to somebody. Mm -hmm. And next thing I know, I get a call from NPR that, and they said, um, this is un unbelievable. You know, could you do this for the radio? Um, so I took the essay and, and re it so it would be better read on the radio. Right. And, um, in the monotone NPR voice yeah, <laughs> and, and recorded it. It became an NPR piece that still, you can find it on the internet today. I mean, it's, it's persisted people. I, I, every once in a while, I hear from somebody who you know, found it and listened to it. It's a very touching piece. Well, it's a critical time. I mean, I, I have it, in my building there was a, a fire department at the base, and they lost eleven of the twelve people. Oh God! Yeah. And the plants out front, and for me, just walking by it was, you know, was it? I was very much involved. I was, you know, a Manhattan night. Well, and everybody is, who was in New York, of course. Yeah, they, anyone. You know, the oddest thing, and I'll say this: New York is a a loud place. And the days after 9-11, if you've ever been to a wake or a funeral, you could walk through Times Square and there'd be a thousand people and you'd have that sound of silence where mm. you kind of like glance up, you see the person, you, there's a little acknowledgement, you move on. And it was a critical time that I, yeah. in my life that I, it just touched me right now or speaking about it. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to COVID when you could walk through Times Square and there was nobody in Times Square. That was I, the spooky. <laughs> I videotaped about 200 hours of COVID on my scooter. I rode 2,000 miles on it and, and have full interviews and documentary of homeless people going up Billionaire's Row, down through Times Square. No one in Times Square. I'll tell you about this afterwards. It's called Brokenhearted New York. 
yeah, yeah. brokenhearted.nyc. You can go to the locked page and you won't get to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I realized once you started putting a brokenhearted things over there, I was already healed. So it was kind of amazing. I so, stopped that project. I'll tell you about it after, you know. So, so we so we have, we have we have one more connection was that that uh, uh, with the, the the shufflers theme song. Oh, that's right, total blam blam. <laughs> oh my god, Kevin is a quality musician. By the way, he not only writes articles and books and and essays, but he wrote a song. He wrote a song called Slides. And my company, Presentation Man Shuffler, with Presentation Man, it's all about slides and slide management. And uh, you can hear it right now. <laughs> That's it. But uh, Kevin wrote, produced, uh, performed it. I was the executive producer. Sure. We've gotten together. Well, yeah. was, well, we, we, we were doing some work together. That's and, right. And um, and I happened to mention to you, I said, I said, you know, you got this presentation and I've got this song I wrote a long time ago about like some poor schlob who's got to sit through like an endless slide presentation is going nuts. And, you know, and, and, um, and, and you said, well, I want to hear it. So I, I made a little demo for you. Yeah. And then you, you said, well, you 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 pay for it to be produced. Let's produce yeah. this thing and have a yeah. song. And so it became yeah. You started using it on your videos, and that's all part of category design. If you can't create the sounds, the smells, the sights, the words, the feelings, you aren't going to own the category. You really aren't. Right. You have to affect every single sense. It's your eyes, your nose, your mouth. This, by the way, dating advice: affect all five senses, and you will capture the emotion <laughs> of the other person that you're with. If you leave them off, you you might make a boring date. I mean, oh, that was just side advice, by the way. <laughs> In any case, the same is the way for building a category. You have to have these things. You know Nike has sounds. You know McDonald's is just loving it. And you have the sounds Intel. Dun, 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 dun. Yep, yep. That's for our old people. But yeah, yeah. I haven't heard that in a long time. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> I think the video is giving them some uh, hard time. So let's wrap this up right here. Sure, yeah. So category design. Yes. Take a moment, tell the crowd, tell the audience what it is, how they can contact you and why you would be a special person for them or the people to leave you alone and the right people to call you. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, no, so category design is a, a, a methodology essentially for a company to go through to, uh, uh, to, to see a new market category they can create, mm -hmm. um, put the words around it to help frame it, set the rules for it, um, and put the company in a position to develop and win this category over time. And um, it's something that we created, um, my, me and my co-authors in this book, Play Bigger. We've since um, formed a firm called Category Design Advisors to act as coaches to take companies through this. And um, it's, 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 it's uh, you know, it's essentially like a project. It takes about mm -hmm. a month or so to, you know, to actually go through the whole process, come out the other end with you know, knowing what that category is and, and, a, and a manifesto for that category, you know, just a bunch of. So literally you're taking a company through a process, your consulting process that helps them hone in on their product, their design, eventually the whole category, trying to define it and help them direct it out the gate so yep, they can right. be a category. Right. And, it, and, and importantly, it's, it's, it's a it's a CEO level strategy um, conversation. I mean, the whole leadership mm -hmm. team is involved, uh, but it's not bolting on a, a branding exercise or something. No, this company. isn't it. This, this is, is actually really... deciding. This is actually deciding what you are as a company and why you need to exist. That makes it makes sense. And then in a simple tense that people know you, you have language that goes into it. Twitter created tweets mm -hmm. and you knew, know that's yelling in the town square. Yep. Right. And from that, that didn't exist. But when it did come out, that became the category and to Elon, it was yeah. worth whatever, 45 billion and less today or whatever yeah. it might be, but it was still a very valuable uh, p commodity. Right, exactly. And and yeah, and that's important, like having, um, you know, a, a language, having a common set of words that, you know, how to describe things so mm -hmm. that everybody in the company is on the same page and using those same words. Th those are all things that matter and actually oh, like totally. to, oh, yeah. to help to create and solidify that category. Yeah, I mean... You can take it further. Every religion is its own category. That's right. Well, they defined right. it with verbiage. They defined it with visuals. They defined it with all types of things. And, and you can do that for a that's company. Right. So that, you're that's like, exactly right. Yeah. So that, that makes sense. Kevin, thank you for coming down to Tampa, down to Embark. We love having you here. And it's good to see you. Good to see you too.